And Mr. Post said, well, I saw your light, and I knew somebody was up. Are you up? Is there sickness in your family? I said, no, I'm working on an insurance case, and I work late because I don't have any telephone uh, interferences. And the girls had gone to bed, because they had to get up. <laughs> and um, he said, well, I'm Wiley Post and I'm conditioning myself to stay awake. And I walk this street every night. I said, how far west do you go? He said, varies. He's non-committal, he, he wasn't a talker. I think the word loquacious, what, uh, what, what does that mean? It, it strikes me that might, uh, short on uh, uh, verbal expression anyway, was what Wiley, uh, and I, Said, oh well, you're, you're Miss, you are Mr. Post. That patch on his eye told me what I needed to know. He said yes, and I said, well, I can invite you in, but it's awfully late. And he said, well, I'm just, uh, I don't see many people up at this hour, and I uh, do this to teach myself how to stay awake. So we became a part of his uh, nocturnal. Uh, would you say um, conditioning, physical mm -hmm. conditioning. And the girls would draw straws to see which one would stay up with him and <laughs> visit with him, and if I had to work. And we talked about aviation. And one day some friends of mine who were also with the government came by. Uh, one of them was a pilot, government pilot. And in those days, that was not too much uh, commercial at that time. And uh, while I got to talking about this convertible pitch propeller, did you ever hear that term? No, ma'am. Well, it was. It's the propeller that they can change the angle of the blades to get a varying degree of of volume into the plane. And Wiley had something to do with that. And he said, do you have some pieces of uh, scratch paper I could scribble on? Sure. And I said, no. I said, the biggest thing I have is uh, my life insurance company's calendar. Big one with big figures. He said, well, we won't hurt it by figuring on the back of it could be. And one of the boys offered to go down to the drugstore. It was still open when he got there that evening to see if they could give them any paper. And I said, well, you can see this, and if you can use it, it's all right. I uh, am not very much on uh, being a hero worshiper. Mr. Post was just another flyer. And there were very few of them in those days. Now, I knew Tip Shearer because he was uh, Garnet Shearer's brother. So uh, they got down on the floor in my living room at 1422 there, West 30th Street, and these two boys who were commercial pilots, well, no, they were for, with the government, and he sketched, and they scribbled. And it was not long after that that he left on this flight. What you looking for? Oh, my plug-in. Go ahead. And um, they followed him on his my mom made a strip around the... Oh, see if that's somebody. Okay. Wait, my door. Cut it off. No, that's fine. Let me see. Today is January 27th. Yes. 1989. Yes. And my that's name four is... Four more days in this month, and then January will be history. Mm -hmm. And my name is Joe Todd... And this is an interview with Miss Esther Lavallee. Uh huh. Are we in Edmond? Huh? Is it? Are we in Edmond? Always in Edmond. Or no. What did you say? Do, you, do you live in Edmond? Oh yes. Okay. Uh -huh. I live. I've lived in Edmond or in its vicinity for 31 years plus eight. Mm hmm. 39 years. I lived off of my. I went moved from my house in Oklahoma City to 79 acres west of Edmond. The, and was there the same length of time, by a mere coincidence, that I was in uh, 
Oklahoma City. So I knew just as many people because in my work I got to know a lot of people. If I may ask, where were you born? In Boone, Iowa, on July the 23rd, 1898. And that wasn't just yesterday either. <laughs> Who was your father? Well, I was legitimate. <laughs> uh, Joseph J. LaValle. And my mother, also legitimate, Iva Anders LaValle, my mother. And I was a mere accident. I wasn't intended. But uh, I uh, evidenced myself. And my father, being much older than my mother, said, well, I'm going to look forward to having a family. And he says, Iva, you're going to take care of that baby before it comes and after it gets here. But she said, and she was a nurse from the Cook County Hospital in uh, Chicago and, to, and preferred dealing with uh, mentally retarded people. So she was well suited and fitted to look after me <laughs> even before I got here. And... Um, but when I came, she told my father's sister and her sister, well, I've had it. Now you can take it and raise it. And here I am, and all of them have gone to their rewards. <laughs> what was your father's vocation? Sold musical instruments, pianos and organs. And there's organs around that neighborhood now. And more organs than there are pianos because they were easier to pay for. But uh, my father sold them. I've had people tell me that, uh, yes, they've seen some organs that my father, all those upright organs that he had sold them. And I used to drive a little buckboard for him because he had impairment vision. He was a uh, Civil War veteran, and his eyes were affected from some, some combat. And I'd drive for him, even before my feet could touch the bottom of the buggy. Which, so, was he on the north or south? South of, it, of Oklahoma City? No. Okay. Did, in the Civil War, did he fight for the north, oh, the north, Union? North, uh -huh. Union. Yes, he was, he was out of Iowa. Any yeah. stories about him in the... No, no. No, no I don't think so. And he, he got his impairment of vision through uh, combat duty. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I grew up, and I, uh, it, my father was poor, and he, I spelled it P-O-R-E, not Peter Below R, because he was that poor. And I had to get away to school if I was ever going to amount to anything. So the Baptist people told me about Baylor College in Belton, Texas. It's a part of, the, of a Baptist school down there, Baylor University. Mary Harden Baylor. Baylor. Huh? Mary Harden Baylor. Yeah, that that that's that's where I, and I went down there. The people of Oakland, of of Hennessy, my father died in a little house that was right under the south side of the water tower that's on uh, uh, Hennessy's main street. But I went to Baylor with very few clothes and an ambition. And uh, there wasn't anything for me that I could do down there to take care of me except wash dishes in the Ely Pepper Hall boarding, uh, dormitory. How did you travel to Baylor? Hmm? How did you travel to Baylor? How did I travel? Mm -hmm. Rock Island Railroad. From Iowa? No, no, from Hennessy. Oh, when the family moved to Oklahoma? Well, they had to move there after I was born, and I was born in 1898 in Boone, so I think it, it had to be shortly after that. Mm -hmm. I, gosh, I haven't thought back over those dates ever before, but anyway, 
Baylor got me, and I was doing all right in the dishwashing setup until they found out where I was hiding the broken dishes. And that nipped my profession as a professional dishwasher in the bud. Where were you hiding the dishes? Under a stairway well. And Mrs. Ely found them, and she said, Esther, that's wrong. God will punish you for that. I said, well, I'm not worried about God as much as I am you. <laughs> and he, she said, well, I'm going to take you out of the kitchen and put you to work out in the garden. And the garden down there was full of rocks, those boulder-type rocks. And I became their gardener. And that was hard work. Everything I had to do was hard work because I didn't have any background or anything else to do it with. And um, I eventually, after I took Spencerian penmanship in school, and I was in the academy there, I had to, t to take whatever I could get to study to get an education any way I could get it. And I eventually took my Spencerian knowledge and ability into the office of uh, Dr. John Crumpton Hardy, the president of Baylor. And he was a born Texan, big fella, outspoken. He, 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 you didn't have to worry about hearing him. It was no effort. He spoke very loudly, very distinctly. And of course, everybody liked Dr. Hardy. And I stayed there till the war came along and I felt the call to get into war work. And I had some friends in the East, and I went to uh, New Haven, Connecticut, and applied for a job at Winchester Repeating Arms Company under J.P. Hager, H-A-G-E-R. And uh, he said, how well do you type and I said only well enough to <laughs> type my own name but I can uh, criticize other people's typing he said how would you like to run the run our scenographic section we have a pool here we don't have enough help for all the engineers and all the departments who need people we have to get good cracked help and uh, have them pooled so that their time is always in use. And um, I said, well, I don't know as much as any of them. And he said, but what they don't know won't hurt them, and it will help you. So I became the head of the typing and transcribing section. I got a picture of that to prove it if I had to. What were your duties there at Winchester Arms? Winchester's? Mm -hmm. They had a contract with the government to supply the 3030 rifle that was the main uh, the main gun for the, uh, for, the for the people for the men in service and what were your duties what was my my job yes in, a, in the stenographic department where the engineers had their work working on the guns and uh, later now they did uh, Hercules powder company supplied the powder for the shells at the 3030. And that was the approved gun, you know, for the service. Were you in the service at all? Yes, ma'am. Well, you were in the late service, and you had a Durand. What was your rifle? No, I had a VM-16 in Vietnam. Oh, well, oh, you, yeah, you were so much later. Well, you got Now, my back. father had the Durand in World War II. Uh-huh. Durand, and, well, and uh, Winchester's, of course, built to a high peak in production. And when the armistice was signed... They were left with futile efforts to build down to a peacetime occupation. And it was a downhill run all the way. And I think right now they are very much in litigation over some of the things that they've tried to do. But I held in my hands the second of the 410 trap shooting guns, lightweight guns, that Mrs. Uh, Ad Topperwine's wife 
she was a trap shooter, professional, and an ex exhibitionist. And her husband was ad top of mine, and they're Texan people. She got the engineers to build this gun for the women for a trap shooting gun. And the men took it away from the women. And when they were first put on the assembly line and finished, Mr. Otterson took me down, and he called me Miss Oklahoma, took me down to the formal place where they were going to hold this reception for the guns, and that was in the uh, uh, assembly room where they were running them, come, bringing them in off the, off the line. And he said, now you're going to take the first gun off of the line and hand it to me and then I'm going to take hand mine to somebody else my secretary and I'm going to hand you the second one and that's going to be your gun those were the 410s the first two 410 skeet guns that were ever put out and they're still being made and you probably used one yes, maybe since then you still have yours no it was stolen and I it did too much publicity, and it was, I don't know how it got away. And I bought one later from a man in Oklahoma City, but it didn't function properly, and I was always afraid of it. But I had a lot of experience in the ballistic laboratories at uh, Winchester's because I had a faculty of being able to talk or to hear and interpret in their broken English the members of the uh, armed forces, they'd come into Winchester's. So I used to demonstrate the handling of the um, Browning automatic machine gun. They made the, uh, I think the Hercules Powder Company supplied the m munitions, and they made the shells in the long cartridge belts. So I would show them how to dismantle, dismount that gun and put it back together again. The and then, VAR. And then shoot it in the, the downstairs uh, underground uh, laboratory where they worked for these people. The French and who else, who all were they? French? Or the Belgians? And, and Belgi well, anyway, they were all the Allied nations. Yeah. And um, I came back after the war was over to Oklahoma City and met to, they went to Enid, and I still didn't know anything about anything except, uh, I couldn't type uh, very well, but I, enough to get by, and that was all. But I had to do something, and I said, well, I'm going to try selling something. And when I got to Oklahoma City, I lived at the Y, and I, you uh, went down to see Mr. Enoch Lusk, L-U-S-K. He owned the Lusk Printing Company that was in the basement of what is now the building that's right across the street from the Lenhart building. And that building was redone by a man whose sister I knew, and he got national honors for the way he worked that building over. But while Mr. Lusk was there, I sold Christmas cards for him. And I met Sidney Burgoyne of the famous Burgoyne Printing Company out of Philadelphia. And to me, for a long time, I didn't know there was any other Christmas card business in the world except Sidney Burgoyne's. And it still stands not for quantity, but quality. And I have some things that he gave me that he went to England and got the, bought the process of printing and brought back to America, and I have some of those Christmas cards in frames here. And I got to know the downtown part of Oklahoma City by going into offices. I didn't have any sense but to go right in and say, I want to talk to the manager. Mark, Mrs. Marquand Huckins was one of the women I met and sold her her Christmas cards. And she knew I lived at the YWCA, and she gave me my first two tickets for the Oklahoma City Symphony so that I would always have somebody to take and she said you must know music too because if you had the background of music your father was a musician why this would just be natural for you and I carried those um, 
those memberships for a number of years till going out at night didn't satisfy me. I just couldn't go at night any longer. And uh, I had my business, my insurance business. I finally got into the insurance business, life insurance business. And that was through my interest in riding in horses. And I rode a horse that had been shipped down here as a derelict from the Longview stables in uh, in Kansas City, their hometown, Longview L Longview Lumber Company. I'm not sure. Well, anyway, Lula Long Combs owned the horse, but he was hard to handle in that he had a tender mouth, and they tried to ride the reins, and you couldn't do that. You had to ride the horse and let him pick up the reins in time, and I learned that early. And he was a show horse. He knew what to do when he got in the show. He was a walk trot, three-gated horse. And I rode him and worked him in the local shows. And one day, I went out to the stables on the East 10th Street, and Basil, I can't remember his last name, Black Boy, was... Um, they're in charge of the help, and they were almost all black. And I rode, and the, we had a riding stable close to the, to the stables there. So I got the girls. I lived at the YW while I was there. And uh, I took the girls out, and I said, Now, we're going to ride horseback. I'm going to ride the horse that I show and, and exercise, and you're going to rent horses over there and learn to ride horseback. Well, one day I came out, and Basil said, your horse has been sold. I said, oh, he said, to a man who's building a cemetery in Oklahoma City. And I said, what's he going to do with a horse? He said, well, he traded a cemetery lot for him. And he doesn't know anything about horses, but he says he does. And he says, he's coming out to see the horse. And he said, you be sure to come out when he's here. And I said, well, I'll try to, but I have to work. And anyway, I came out one day and Basil said, well, the man who owns this horse was here. He says, he's a big fella and loud. And he said, he said, I own that horse and I want to see him. And put a saddle on him. I want to try him. And he says, I told him that unless he knew how to ride, he better not do that. He says, I can handle him. He says, all right. Well, most of the help was black. Basil helped him up on the horse. And the saddle they put on him was the typical flat saddle. And the first thing he did was to pull up on the reins when he got on him, and Flash went right straight up in the air, and he went off. There was nothing to hold to hold him on. And the boys didn't offer to help him up. And Basil said, I'm sorry. I'm just glad you're not hurt. He said, well, if there's somebody can ride that horse, who is it? He said, it's a lady. What's she doing for a living? We don't know. We never ask her. They just know she rides Flash and rides him right and shows him. He said, well, if she can ride that horse, she can sell cemetery lots. And that was my entrance. I rode into the cemetery business on one of the most beautiful walk trout horses, Flash. And when first time I went into the show ring on him, B.B. Tucker was the judge on that class. And he saw me come into the ring, and of course, we were always taught to come in boldly on a high, bold trot. Well, Flash had it. And when we came into the ring, old B.B. took his hat off and he said, Interpreter, how did you get down here? And he was looking at the horse, and he looked at me and he said, This horse is from the Longview Stables in Kansas City. He says, he's owned with somebody down here. He said, you didn't buy him. I said, no, I just ride him. He said, well, there's very few people who could. But he said, uh, you got a good horse. 
Well, I won, I think, second. I never won a first with him. I won second in any class that I ever put him in. And when we had the original horse shows out on the east side of Oklahoma City in the fairgrounds. Did you know the cemetery? I mean, did you know the uh, the, the uh, uh, fairgrounds on the east side of Oklahoma City, East 10th Street yeah. at any time? Well, that's where. And we always, the horse show that I worked in, the Society Horse Show, was always held at the same time the fair was going on. And we had that to worry about because when the fireworks went off, generally, if if uh, the horses didn't notice it, the riders would. But I lived through that. And eventually, Beck said, well, you're going to get into the cemetery business. I'm going to send you out to see a couple of good cemeteries and show you how to sell cemetery lots from an investment. And he did just that. And I learned a lot from Mr. Beck, but I f favored his wife. I liked her better than I did him. He was too, too loud. And I always felt like his acquaintance with the then district attorney was Roy St. Louis, an Indian. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure he was part Indian. And it always occurred to me that now why did Mr. Beck pick that man as a society contact or social contact? He had him and his wife everywhere whenever they had a dinner, and that's the way Beck treated his uh, salespeople. And the business was good for me, because I sold over, I sold the appointments over the telephone, and then went out and closed them in person. And I'd never done that work before in my life, because I didn't know anything about it. I had to learn by trial and error. And um, I worked at that. And then Mr. Lewis and his wife were always at all the parties. I never asked anybody why he was there, because it wasn't any of my business. But two years ago, out in my backyard, a man came here who had been an employee of the Daily Oklahoman. At the time, I was active in the cemetery lot business. And I said, I've always wondered why Roy St. Louis was so closely aligned with Mr. Beck, and he said, well, I can tell you. He was under Mr. Roy St. Louis un as a probationer. He had just uh, paid his debt to society for fraud in a penitentiary and did two years, and he was out on good behavior. And he said, uh, nobody else knew it. And I said, well, I never asked him. And he put Memorial Park in. And the first burial in that cemetery was the husband of my dressmaker. And I can't remember now what her name was. I'd have to go out and look. But right across the walkway from where he's buried, I later sold a cemetery lot to a man whom I later worked for who was a dentist in Oklahoma City, and who was one of the starters of the uh, original Oklahoma City Dental School. I don't know whether they have a dental school here now or not, but that was F.J. Reichmann, R-E-I-C-H-M-A-N-N, a German. And he was a brilliant uh, man, aside from his dental work. And I got him on horses, started to ride, and he was joined the National Guard. And for a while, they were able to get the National Guard people to support their horses. But the National Guard found out that it was pretty expensive, so they quit. So most of the uh, of the boys who had horses at that time sold them. And uh, I never did own a horse of my own until I later bought one of those horses when the man wanted me to have it badly enough to let me have it and pay for him when I could. And that, that was Kiowa, and he was the biggest three-gated horse, standard bred, that had ever gone into the show ring. So from there on down the line, I stayed in the sales business, mostly uh, after I left the cemetery. And then Mr. Beck got in trouble over 
the cemetery here, but he built it. He built the one at Tulsa before he came over here and built this one. Then he went to Cleveland, Ohio and put a cemetery in up there. And up in the cemetery in Ohio, his wife wrote to me one time and said, well, I want to give you Chris's address. He's going to be a permanent resident at Leavenworth for two years. He's taking the rap on the violation of the blue sky laws of Illinois and Ohio for two of his salespeople. He can't get out of it. He's got to take it. But she said he knows how, how uh, uh, the uh, people live in these uh, closely confined areas. But she said, you can write to him. But I never did. But I kept in touch with her, and they moved to California. And out in California, when he finished his time, he went to work for his son. He could work that way, but I don't know why. I never have asked him why he could um, not get um, a, a job for himself. But he worked under a plush uh, real estate development in California under Bill Beck, his son. And I lost track of them after that. But Mr. Beck uh, made it possible for me to make my first real money. That painting, right, that uh, steel engraving right there was one of two that I traded a lady, a lady a lot for. And she took the other one, and I got this one. And I've had it ever since. And uh, the lady who owned them bought the lot. And she destroyed the mutilated plates of those to prove that there was no others could be uh, uh, to be printed from it. Uh, so the cattle? picture oh, I yeah. do have his the Moran is the name and he's a brother of the famous painter who did the Grand Canyon yeah. art to work. So those things all date me back to those early days in sales work, and I am still an associate of two major insurance companies, and here's where I do all of my work, mostly. Could you give me a description of Hennessy? Huh? Could you give me a description of Hennessy when you Hennessey? lived there? Hennessy? Yeah, as a small girl. It's a little town between uh, Bison and Dover on the Rock Island. And I was living there as a child, when the uh, Rock Island Line lost a train over the Cimarron River. I think the Cimarron, I don't, I don't think it's Canadian, I think it's Cimarron River. Uh, and it went down, and some of the Hennessy people were on that train that day when that went down into the river. And I can't remember whether they ever got the engine out, but there was quicksand in the river. But these men broke the windows and got out of the train and got back. And I remember distinctly of the wrecker coming through on the line and going down there to see what they could do after the train had gone down. But um, And though these boys were, uh, uh, were Hennessy boys, and Roy Cashin was a Hennessy boy. And he was one of the uh, members of the crew on a submarine, early submarines, and got went down, submerged, and got stuck, and all of them perished. And I thought they had done some memorial for him in Hennessy, but my father's buried there, but I've never gone back. I just don't look back on many things except regrets of things that I did do and when I shouldn't have done. But Hennessy is full Pack Hennessy is his remains. He was an early trader. He was killed by the Indians and he's buried in Hennessy. And that's where the name of the little town came from. Tell me that story about Pat Hennessy. Well I don't know it because he was dead before yeah. I got there and he was his bones were buried in a, in a lot out on the southwest corner of the little town of Hennessy, and that's where the name of the town came from. But uh, he is, um, uh, he was a trader, and um, I, I, it's too bad that uh, some of the early historians here
could tell it. Did you hear, ever hear of Jack Alley on the faculty at OU? Well, now he could have told you because he was one of the school principals there at one time. And he could have told you about Pat Hennessy. And Hennessy could tell you about him, but that's all I know about him. And it, there's an iron framework, a little, little fence built around his grave there. And my father's buried in the same town, and my, and my, my mother is buried in Oklahoma City. Her ashes are rather. Where did you start to school? Where did I start to school? Yes, ma'am. Hennessy. What was the name of the school? Oh, let's see, the Hennessy Public Schools, the only thing that could have been named. Mm -hmm. How large was the school? How many? How large was the school building? How large was the school? Mm -hmm. I don't remember. That's too far away, man. <laughs> But Jack Alley was one of the principals who later went to Oklahoma to Norman in the, on the faculty down there. And it was through um, the girl at the, um, well, the, the managing editor of the Oklahoma Today that I called there to find out the name of the uh, man who had uh, found out where he was who wrote the story about Wiley Post because I liked it and I wanted to tell him so. And she said, well, he's on sabbatical leave to Washington doing a story, a political story. And I said, oh, my, what did that man do to earn the win to deserve that? And she laughed. She said, his ability to write. And I said, well, give him a message for me when he comes back that I commend him for his ability to write it a good story. Did you ever read that? Yes, ma'am. And uh, it's a nicely done story. Now, Anita Andrushek was a lady in the um, business of antiques. She get, became an appraiser and a very good one. She and her husband was in the oil business. She worked for F.C. Hall, the oil man who was associated with Wiley and who put up the money for these, this trip that he made. And uh, she worked for 15 years as uh, F.C. Hall's bookkeeper. And I called her and I said, if this young man wants to ask you any questions about what you know about what your association with Mr. Hall, who was associated with Wiley Post, do you mind my telling him? She said, no, tell him. And she's A N D R I C H A K. I think isn't that Polish? Could be. A N D R I C H A K, and his name is Michael. But she's listed as O N E T O Onito, uh, Andrushek, and uh, she is uh, able to talk on the telephone. She, I'm pretty sure she's much younger than I am. She did my. Uh, a resume of all of my household things for me and when a man read it he said where can I get in touch with her and I said what for he said that's the nicest gotten up appraisal I said she's quit mine was her swan song she doesn't want to do anymore <laughs> and they live on Northwest 39th the, uh, Terrace in Oklahoma City and she said now, I'd be glad to have to talk to him and I don't know what but I sent her a copy of the Oklahoma Today that had that story in it about Wiley and I never called him Wiley I always said Mr. Post and when he came back from this flight but he and Will Rogers lost their lives one of these boys who had been at my house as a, a pilot that night when he came by and took the back of my calendar and drew sketches of this propeller called me and I can't remember whether he was stateside or whether he was calling over from overseas but he said have you got that old calendar yet and I said no it went out that year in the trash he, those sketches would have been priceless I said now you're telling me and it had to take a dead man to bring it to life to you and he said I know well, we were thinking about it, and he said, it was when we sat on the floor, and he drew those pictures, those sketches, 
And I think, wasn't Wiley one of the um, originators of the first space yes. suit? Yes. Well, I remembered that. He invented the automatic pilot. Huh? The automatic pilot he invented. Was it? Yes. Well, well now, Tip Shearer, I used to fly between the Oklahoma City Airport and Tulsa, going over to the uh, the uh, cemetery in uh, Tulsa, and he'd set that plane and go off and leave and come back and sit with the with the, uh, the passengers, and that word me and I said, Mr. Shearer, will that plane take care of itself? And he said, Yes, it's on a pilot, automatic, and I said, Can it land? He said, I've never tried that. And he was the brother of Garnet Shear, G-A-R-N-O-T, and she was a good friend of mine. And uh, uh, Tip flew private, he was a private pilot for an oil company, I believe out of Bartlesville. Phillips? Phillips, was it? Is, was that in Bartlesville? Yes, ma'am. He got out of his plane one day after he landed it, after he'd had those executives someplace, and collapsed and died. Garnet told me that, and she said, wasn't it by the grace of God that he got those people all down before that happened? And I said, did he have a history of heart? No. And I got a letter from a girl the other day. Her husband was a graduate of uh, Stillwater, magna cum laude, John Venable. He had been riding a bicycle out in Fort Collins, Colorado, and got off his bike collapsed and died. And that's been, and she, my letter just recently told me that. I've known so many people who've achieved things, but, um, and I haven't gotten myself <coughs> around to writing her a letter yet, but I will. But these people, Laura Ambrose, one of the highest salaried mercantile women in the United States at the time, at, at the height of her career, was Mrs. John A. Brown's controller. She was a good friend of mine. And she married a fellow named Howard Ray Raymond Long. He made publicity front page not long ago when somebody broke in and mussed him up, uh, in, uh, invaded his apartment. And he's still living, but she's buried out at Memorial Park on a lot that I sold her. And these people whom I've known all these years have contributed something to me because I've always said I cultivate the people who've achieved something. Maybe someday I will, but I never did. I just sat in the afterglow. <laughs> Would you give me a good description of Wiley Post? Could I give you a description of him? Yes, ma'am. And my me memory of him was a little chunky, stocky man with a patch over his, wasn't it his left eye? Well, over one eye, that's that's safe enough. They can put it where it belongs. Not a, not a uh, person who talked fluently, except when he got into his field, aviation. And how he ever got a pilot's license, I don't know, and that story didn't go into detail, but he talked himself into a license and he flew in Wiley Post, I mean, uh, uh, Will Rogers flew with him. And I'd met Will Rogers when he was a featured uh, in-between acts with the Ziegfeld Follies in New York City. I went down there from uh, from uh, Connecticut, from New Haven, and Mr. Otterson sent me with a party, and um, he said, uh, I uh, want you to go down and see the Follies tonight, and I'm going to send you down with my wife and some of her friends, and he said, uh, I'll give you a letter to the manager of the uh, theater, and he'll let you backstage to meet Will Rogers. And that's where I met Will Rogers, is in New York City, twirling his rope. What did you think of him? What did I think of him? Yeah, Will Rogers. Uh, I don't think I ever formed any opinion of him. 
I basked in the reflection of his popularity, and of course they, all the girls liked him who were in the in the follies um, in the chorus, and he would talk to himself mostly when he was doing his rope trick, and uh, I I kept uh, a lot of those programs in a book form, and I still have it because uh, Mr. Otterson sent me. If he knew some of the people in New York who were the critics, he would um, say, well, you ought to meet them because you'll never have any other opportunity to meet them. And um, I used to go from the Winchester. Have you ever been in New Haven? No, ma'am. Well, it's out on Dixwell Avenue uh, when, and uh, uh, into town, and the, it just spread out all over the, the area out there. And I used to go into town for errands. Mr. Otterson would send me on. And um, one day, uh, Yale University and the campus was quite uh, open always. I heard an organ, and I followed up the sound of it. And it was at uh, Battelle Chapel, one of the buildings at Yale. And uh, the organist was rehearsing for a program. And a little old man was at the door and he said, Missy, do you want to go in and hear Dr. Bingham? And I said, can I go in? He said, yes, I'll take you in the chapel. And it wasn't too big a chapel, but it was built by as a memorial to a son of a couple who had died. And they built that B-A-T-T-E to -E L, I think was the way they spell it. And he was up with a great organ up in the loft. And uh, I used to stop in there, and Mr. I told Mr. Otterson I'd stop in, and he said, well, whenever I send you to town, if he's practicing or rehearsing, go in and listen to him, because he's one of our great organists. Later, years later, the Organist Guild of Oklahoma City brought him to Oklahoma City uh, in a lecture and a concert, and I re met him again. And he said, oh, this is the first time I've been this far west. He said, there's a lot of opportunities out here in this country. And a man who was a sales manager of a little store, a little uh, ready-to-wear store, on the ground floor of the building across west of the First National Bank building, uh, was an organist. And he played a number of Seth Bingham's compositions. At noon hours, when the crowd would be in there, they had a little, little soda fountain bar in the building there, and I guess it's still there. But he said, yes, I've played some of his numbers on my concerts. And, and uh, Mr. Bingham was, uh, Dr. Bingham it was, and, uh, but I had never met him except right there at his organ in the, up in the loft. And I never did get up into the loft, uh, but I sat out down. He played many a number for me as the only one listening to them. The War March of the Priests from Attilia, he played one day, and you could just hear those rafters vibrate because he really stepped on it. <laughs> and there's not very many organs as big as the organ was there. How many ranks that, did that organ have? Huh? How many ranks in that organ? How many what? How many ranks in the organ there? How many what? Ranks. How many sets of pipes in that organ? I wouldn't know. Yeah. But there was a hell of a lot of them. Am I on the air? <laughs> Do you remember Statehood Day? I wasn't here. That was 1907. No. I, I, I could have been here, but I didn't. Uh, when the run? No, no. The Statehood. When we became I, a state I, no, in 1907. I don't remember them. If I was here... Uh, they they didn't register. Yeah. Because I was a poor child. My father was an improvident, uh, happy-go-lucky Frenchman, and my mother was a hard-boiled English uh, background. Uh, people lived in Boone, Minburn, Iowa, and I think she married my father after his first wife died of tuberculosis, more thinking she was going to get to handle the estate this first wife had left. But my father had other thoughts about that. He um, dispersed that estate with complete abandon 
and my mother didn't get done anything out of it, and her people were well-to-do, conservative farm people out of Boone and Minburn, Iowa, is where they lived. But she stayed married and had me, much to her utter disgust, and uh, I grew up completely uh, devoid of any home life you might speak of. And so I always uh, gravitated in older times when I met people. They had nice family relationships. I always got myself involved in their home life because I'd never had any. So it was something that I wanted to absorb as much of as I could because I hadn't had any of it. And the lady across the street is the widow of a man who died two years ago. They have the loveliest, most beautiful family relationship. And out in the western part of the state, on one of their farms out there, they have the highest producing gas well in the state. And she and her daughters, had four daughters, nothing. I said one day to Mr. Tidball, I said, was daughters all you could do? He said, well, give me A for trying. And uh, one daughter is married to uh, Judge Macy's right-hand man mm -hmm. who has accepted an appointment in Washington in the Judiciary Department, and they're moving to Washington. Yeah. And another one has, the, uh, has an automotive uh, parts uh, business in Oklahoma City. And the third one is married to a United Airlines pilot out of Chicago. She flies down about once every six weeks or so. They gave her a little car. She parks it at the airport. She comes out, gets out of the plane, gets in her car, comes out here, visits, does whatever her mother needs her to do since her father has died. And um, uh, she's very much at home behind the wheel. And I think, oh, her husband's a pilot. And the United Airlines has been one of the lines that has never been involved in bringing in cocaine. Yeah. And this man is an Air Force colonel, I believe. Well, he's, he's a ranking officer in the uh, reserve officers. And his name is, I think it, their name is Johnson. And he is really a nice guy. Well, they're just all the nicest people. No smokers in the bunch except their father, and he died of emphysema. Tell me, how did? Why did you go to Connecticut from Baylor? Why did I go? Yes, ma'am, to work. Left for Baylor to go into war work. Why, Connecticut? Oh, I want. Uh, let's see. Uh, somebody was up there at Yale. See, Yale's at New Haven, mm -hmm. and that's where I was heading for. Yale? For the area, because, of course, they wouldn't take underclassmen, and I was j just in the academy down at Baylor. And um, I have no degrees from any school, but I've sure gone to school an awful lot, and I'll put up my knowledge against a lot of these people who have sheepskins. <laughs> What is the academy at Baylor? Baylor? Yeah, well, that's, well, that's all it was. was an academy. Well, they've oh. had they've had the upper class ones. The academy was was uh, before you entered uh, the college. Oh. What did you study at Baylor? Mainly speech. You study elocution? Yes. And they taught the uh, book, the cl one of their class of textbooks was uh, the Curry School of the Spoken Word out of Boston. And I later went up to the Curry School and said, hmm, I studied one of your textbooks. And that's where Mary uh, Mike Baker Eddy is buried, is in, uh, let's see, is it Boston? No. Where is Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of the, the uh, Christian Science Church? I believe it's Boston. And that's where I had my first air first submarine ride from Mr. Otterson. He sent me to uh, where was the port? New London. 
No, New London, Connecticut, and now that's where the the boat reviews used to be held. Oh, I love those sailboat reviews. That's where I saw Sir Thomas Lipton, the tea man, lose to the U.S. Resolute, I believe it was, lost uh, that race that year. I believe it was that I was up there, but oh, that regatta, the, the boats coming across that bed of water, and that water was clean in those days. It's pitiful now. Not at all like it was then. And I climbed to the top of the Statue of Liberty just to be able to say that I had been up in it and the uh, sailors were on shore leave that, that day. And we have a former uh, submarine commander living here now. His name is, um, let's see, B B Kelly, John, John Kelly. Uh, and the funniest thing, I met his wife, she's a volunteer worker over at the hospital over here. And when I was there, let's see, one day to see somebody about some x-rays, and uh, they came out here and I gave him some flowers. Now that's not turned on now, is it? No. Okay. I'm going to tell a story. <laughs> I don't want to go on. Uh, they were out here on the south side of my house, and he's a little fella. And I could always visualize him in his natty uh, naval uniform as an officer with his gold and black braid. And one day out here in the, on the south side of the house, I said, C Commander, you've had a career as a seagoing submarine commander, and you've fathered eight children. I said, how in the world did you manage that how often did you have shore leave? Was it systematic, periodic? He said, I had a hell of a good backup, ma'am. And his wife stood there and kind of smiled. Four boys and, let's see, no, one boy, the James lives here, and I think they've got another son. Six, six kids, all girls. And one of his daughters is a very successful businesswoman over in Oklahoma City. And I got a Christmas card from them at Christmas and I said, I can just see you. And it was in a ship. I believe it was also out of Boston that Mr. Otterson saw to it that I and two of my uh, escorts who always went with me if I was carrying engineering plans or, or, or specimens for somebody to a, a trip in a submarine. And I could just, we, we were thrilled to death. The boys, of course, were younger than I was, and they were just thrilled to death. One of them said, oh, I just, I'm, I'm going to look forward to this trip in this sub, and I could just see them. They were, we were greeted as they went up the gangplank. The commanding officer had a note from Mr. Otterson, and of course he was in, mil in, in munitions, and that was one way that they could get in, because a lot of their big shells that they used in those under, uh, sub submers submersible guns were... Uh, were fueled with um, or made at Winchester's and I had two of them made into magazine racks and somebody stole them 16 oh about this tall and I got away with some of the original uh, armor piercing bullets that were made to combat the armored airplane that the Germans put out and they were the Springfield rifle shell put into belts mm -hmm. and I uh, lost those <laughs> but uh, that what submarine they, were you on huh which submarine did you go on I couldn't remember that name but I remember going up the gangplank and the officers all at the at the, the uh, on uh, on the uh, on the surface of it I think three or four of them, and this commanding officer greeting us, and he said, you are our guests for a um, trip uh, uh, below surface. And I said, yes, arranged by somebody. And these boys were just all eyes, and uh, I was young enough that I didn't 
didn't have too much intelligence about what I was appreciating getting. But I can remember, and they closed the hatch on us, and we went down, and they gave the orders. All the miniature posts prepare to submerge. And this commander, I, I repeated some of the commands to him who's here, and he said, well, you've been down on one, all right. And you could feel the quiver of that boat when it would prepare to submerge. And then we took us around underwater and around the Boston Harbor. And then uh, the order came, all hands at your post, prepare to surface. And they had to work their little machinery all around. Mm -hmm. and then, so that was, that was living. That was what I always think of the story that I heard later about some of the things that I was witnessing. The colored man was watching his friend who had passed away, and he had asked that he be buried unconventionally in his beautiful Cadillac. So they dug the grave big enough to take care of the Cadillac and him at the wheel. And he was, as he was being lowered into his grave, this friend stood on the bank and watched. And as it went down, this friend said, Man, oh man, now that's what I call living. <laughs> and that was the last, uh, we were the last civilians to be accorded the courtesy of a trip in a submarine. And Commander uh, Kelly, he, he might be a, might, a man, for, they moved here, I don't know how they got here to Edmond from uh, the east, but they drove back, they went back there this year, I think they were married in the east, and one of their sons lives here, and he's had bad health, and one of the daughters has a successful business here. They live here now? John, John Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y. K -E -L -L -Y. Was he and a submarine he, commander in World War II? Sir? Was he in World War II? Yes. Oh. Yes, it was too. Yeah, heavens. <laughs> and he's a little fella. And I, could, I said, Commander, I can just see you in your white uniform and your natty little cap and your black and gold braid and your epaulets on your shoulders. And he'd just look at me and grin. <laughs> when did you go to New Haven? What year? What, what? When did you go to New Haven to work in Winchester? When World War Number 1 was going on. 1917? I don't remember. Mm -hmm. I've never been asked that before. I can remember some things, but date's awful. Yeah. Tell me some stories about New Haven. Well, Grove Street Cemetery is where all the dignitaries are buried, and it has a high wall around it. And I, it was my first uh, old cemetery that I'd ever visited, and I acquired an interest in them. Webster of the uh, Dictionary fame is buried there, and of course a lot of famous people were uh, students at Yale, and uh, no classmen, uh, women, were allowed in the underclass uh, college, but they could go in under the upper class in getting a master's degrees and things, and I met several women who were uh, typical, oh, brainy people who were in school in the... Uh, college in the upper, what did they call that? Well, anyway, they, they couldn't enter unless they had a degree from some other college. It, it, it took that to get in. Mm -hmm. And uh, Professor Bingham, Dr. Bingham, from uh, was the organist at the uh, Battelle Chapel in Yale. Have you ever been to New Haven? No, ma'am. Old Elms and New Ideas. And the campus, of course, was quite... Uh, uh, typical of college, and uh, wasn't it Ingersoll, who was the atheist? I think I that was his home. And I and boarded at a place, had a room in, in one apartment building, walk up, and, and boarded at another one, and at the, the boarding house was a Scot from uh, Edinburgh. Scotland, 
and I cultivated him because I wanted to learn that accent because I did a, a number of readings and I'd used ac used uh, uh, the vocabulary of ver various people and um, when he came here he was sent here to do the soft stone masonry work on one of Yale's buildings and he was the only man qualified they they knew who could do that work so I talked to him about Scotland and he knew Harry Sir Harry Lauder and uh, he used to say uh, oh lass you should go to Scotland sometime and go out and see the purple heather on the moor you'll never never forget it and he sent me some purple heather and some white heather from the moor of course scott was one of his uh, one of his writers and when i had to go into the saint anthony hospital for some minor surgery a man came in one night to close the windows and he said something and i said oh you're from bonnie scotland alas how did you guess it I said, well, that language you're using in the accent. And he said, Roman in the gloaming. And that was one of Harry Lauder's famous songs. Roman in the gloaming with my bony by my side. And he'd come in and sing to me at night for the three days that I was there. <laughs> and, uh, and I lost track of him after that. But the Scott are beautiful people. And... Uh, they, 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 that accent, that burr, was something that uh, you couldn't duplicate it. And I used to try to say the words that he'd teach me. Now say that again, Lars, and you'll get it. <laughs> but I didn't use it often enough to become perfect. Who is this man on television who comes on and interprets men, and he has their marvelous accent? What is he? What is his name? He's a young fellow. You know who I'm talking about. I'm trying to think. Well, oh, he's a marvelous uh, uh, impersonator. And anyone who can impersonate some of those people. Oh, uh, Rich just, Little? Huh? Rich Little? That yeah. Name? Yeah. <laughs> and I heard him not long ago in something, just a, just a, just a bare run through. Mm -hmm. And I wondered what he was doing, because he surely, he's not making his living on television with that. Yeah. When did you graduate? From high school or college? Huh? From high school or college? College. Well, I finally got my degree in 1974. 74. And, and where? University of Oklahoma. Oh, you. Well, Jack Alley could have been there in history at that time. And uh, uh, see my little statues? Mm hmm. Joe Taylor. Did you remember Joe Taylor in Joe? the fine arts department? Okay. The sculptor? Mm -hmm. I saw one of those one time. Somebody gave it to me, and I said, those are my beautiful labs. And I took it. It went out to a lumber yard and got those pieces of wallet. That just what I wanted. Mm -hmm. And I had them put on those bases and made into lamps. And John Frank from the Frank Oma right. Pottery, I took one of them over to him one day, and he said, I'll make you another one of these if you'll promise me to take this one down and let Joe see it. That's uh, Norman. And he was out, he had a farm out from Norman and cattle, and he was out there one day when I brought, took that down there, and... Um, uh, I set it up and had her come in and she said oh my that brings back memories you know I posed for that and I said well if you did then that makes it all the more valuable to me and she said and I'm going to have a pair of those made into lamps and Joe Taylor has passed away, I think, since then. But they, they live they live in that house of glass down at Norman. Do you know uh, where it is? Mm -hmm. Made famous by some architects for the one of its kind. And I, once in a while, I'll call her because I have 
Frank Home of Pottery that I use every day. And over they moved to Sepulpa because Chamber of Commerce at Sepulpa thought that they had the clay that they could use, and that's where they ended up. And uh, I think he, he, I know he died at Sepulpa, and his daughter has taken over, and they had a fire at the pottery. And um, she's running it again, and I've never been back. I've never, I don't travel anywhere much anymore. I don't care about getting out from a physical standpoint, and then I don't have any reason to be out. What kind of man was John Frank? Huh? What kind of man was John Frank? What kind of a man was yeah. he? Mm -hmm. I never knew him. I knew him only through correspondence. And he he did come up one day with his wife and stopped at my house at 1422 West. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, no. I've only had pottery since I lived in Edmond. But he saw some pottery that I had, and he turned around to his wife, and he said, Honey, I love this woman. She really likes my wares. And I have the green uh, design and a great deal of it. And he made these up for me, but I, I had to go between. And when he made the second one up, and when uh, uh, he said, I'll... Uh, I'll make this second one up for you if you'll promise to go. Let's see. No, I'm I'm foggy on that as to how how I got that second one. But I had to promise to take the finished lamp down to let Mrs. Frank see it, mm -hmm. and I did. Uh, tell me about the trip from Baylor to New Haven during the war. I went by um, rail and didn't have the uh, any other way of getting around, not flying. I never flew till I came back and flew first with Tip Shearer. Was it strictly a civilian train or were there soldiers on the train? Were they what? Were there soldiers on the train? No. No, no. no. It, was, it was just a regular passenger okay. train. But I've seen the troop trains go through on the Rock Island. That's the only, I thought that the Rock Island was the only railroad in the country because it ran through Hennessy from the north, I guess Kansas City, down to Texas, and I went went to Texas on it, down to Fort Worth and then to Temple. And then, I don't remember how I got from Temple over to, I mean from, uh, let's see, where did I get to Temple to Baylor? I've forgotten how I got there, but I got there. What about Armistice Day? Huh? What about Armistice Day, the day the war ended? Say what? Armistice Day. When the armistice was signed. The armistice. Yes. I was in New Haven when the armistice was signed. Yeah. Is there a big celebration? Oh, then the town went wild. Tell me about it. I don't remember anything except they told me to get off the street. Because <laughs> they had a lot of uh, foreigners in New Haven, uh, Italians especially. And I remember one story they used to tell about the man who had a little wagon, a little vegetable wagon, he had a little sign on it and it said, if you must pinch you the fruit, pinch you the coconut. <laughs> Were you a flapper? No. No? No. I didn't have time. I had to work always. I didn't have any affairs. Escaped all that. Never learned to smoke. Never learned to drink. But I did learn to say damn pretty proficiently. And I have a retired major from the U.S. Corps of Engineers who's my yard man. And he's so inconsistent with his aversion for strong language. And when I say damn, his eyes will fly open like a crocodile's mouth. One day I said, well, damn it, major. Or sometimes I call him soldier. See, you went through the service. You're bound to have heard a lot of this uh, strong talk. Well, yes, but I didn't pick it up. And I said, well, you're not picking it up now, but it's my way of expressing my feelings. So you just have to put up with it. <laughs> what did you say? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me some more about the buggy you used to drive for your father. The buggy? Yeah. Just an old two-seated buggy with a canopy over the top. 
and me sitting with the whip in, at, in, in the socket. One horse? One horse, yes. But I learned to drive tan tandem in the horse show. I do one time for Mrs. God, I can't remember her name. She was the um, the wife of a restaurant man out of Chicago, and um, she come down here with her little hackneys, and I drove one year for her. And she dressed me, put me into the kind of clothes she wanted me to wear when I rode in her buggy, and she'd get me drunk most of the time. Uh, uh, Ethel Barrymore came here one year. I used to go down and help sell tickets at the Shrine Auditorium. She came here in the Corn is Green Road Company. She was so drunk, but that was legendary, typically, of herself and her brothers, John and Lionel. And I saw them in New York in the play, The Jest. And I saw Lionel play Hamlet at Yale and helped them sell tickets for the performance. <laughs> I've always kept up with the art people where I could and met Joe Benton from Norman when he came back from Italy as Giuseppe Bentonelli. and came down to Oklahoma City under Mary Garden's aus aus what's the word I want to say? Well, anyway, on, in her uh, opera company, and he's from Sayre, Oklahoma, and that's where I met him some time before he ever came, settled at Norman, and became uh, head of the voice department. and. Uh, I got to know him there, and he'd call me, because you could call between Oklahoma City and Edmond without any toll. And he'd say, uh, Esther, I'm going to have uh, a recital one night this week. All my own students, one woman, a mezzo-soprano, I want you to hear her. I think she'll go far. And we used to go down for the drive down for the recitals and afterward Wilda Griffin another girl who uh, a girl who had uh, been sent to Italy after he was sent there by people and she did not know who the people were who were sending her but she was there while he was there and she came back had a gorgeous voice too Wilda Griffin and her father was in one of the banks at Hennessy, and they moved to Norman. And I don't remember whether he was a banker at Norman or not. But um, anyway, the two of them were responsible for Eva Turner coming from England. He, she was with the Covent Garden Opera. And I got to meet her on several occasions at some of these parties. And one night I sat next to Eva, and Joe was on this side when we were having refreshments in the home of, I think it was Wilder Griffin's home, and Joe reached over back of me and says, Eva, put that little tray that had those nuts in it back on that tray. And I kind of looked, and Eva was sitting there. She's a big woman. And you could hear her open the window of her studio on the campus when she came back here and talked. You could hear her belt out anything uh, all over the campus. But he said that night, uh, he said, Eva, put that little nut cup back on that tray. He said, you're not taking it as a souvenir. And I sat there between them and I looked at him and he wasn't looking at me. He was watching her from in front of me, but he was talking back of me to her. He said, put it back, or I'll reach over there and take that purse away from you. You're not going to take that as a souvenir. She reached in her purse, took it out. He said, "Add a girl. Now don't take any of the silverware for souvenirs either. <laughs> and, and Eva was that, and she'd take food to her room and put it in a dresser drawer and it would spoil 
and, and the, the girls would tell me about it. <laughs> and she used to come up to my farm. I had my string of horses out on an acreage west of Edmond. She'd get out in the runway and sing to my horses. And uh, one day <laughs> she wore a straw hat and she laid it up on the dividing line between two of the box stalls and my Palomino saw it and he reached over and just took a bite out of the, the, the brim of it. And she said, well, and here I've been singing to you parts of my operas. And Joe would say, not opera, but opera. And she, that bite where he took that out of that crown, that rim of that, she still wore it. And then when she came back from England, see, uh, she was made a dame by the queen. And so she's a friend of the family. And uh, this friend of mine was in London, and he had a writing habit made for me, and I still have it, made by Buzzvines, the costumers to the royal family. Beautiful material. You want to see it? Yeah. It's quite, quite, well, no, nobody ever had anything like it when they rode in the horse shows. But uh, those people are all people just, uh, I just naturally, as they easily got acquainted with them and had something either they wanted or something I could do for them that no one else could do, and I would do it because it was my uh, my reward. And recently, meeting Mrs. Chilton Powell, the uh, oh Bishop Powell's wife, retired bishop yeah. of the uh, of the Episcopal Church, I've never met him, never seen him, but my bookman, do you know James Neal North, the bookman in Ed, in Oklahoma City? I know who he is. Well, he referred me to her, and I've never seen her, but she's having dental work done this week, an extraction on one, and after that's over, I'm going to her home with my major taking Christmas cards made up into things that they're going to use this year. And I've got Christmas cards in boxes all over the damn place. And I've made bookmarks. I've made, yes, put them uh, into uh, categories where they could take them and send them to a school, a children's school they have somewhere in the mountains, and a retirement home besides the Canterbury. And uh, I told her that I had, uh, Major Schott had driven me by Canterbury. And I don't like it. It's made of dark red brick. It's 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 doomy to me. But you you can move in there and you can take a pet in. But if you lose it, you can't have another one. I wouldn't go anywhere I couldn't have a dog. Mm -hmm. And that's the dog, D-O-G, that I picked up on the highway starving to death. This is from the military. And her background with a pedigree is... Um, from Tibet. She's the house dog in P Tibet. And she warns people when somebody's coming. And she does just that. And she has to be groomed ever so often because her hair gets um, matted. And I was up at four o'clock and groomed three dogs this morning. And I'm going to bed after a while after I have my lunch and sleep it off. <laughs> and I never learned to drink never learned to smoke and I'm so thankful because these tobacco people did you know that the tobacco industry the cigarette people have bought up practically all of the food businesses and beverage businesses so when you go in are you a married boy no ma'am well even if that you go to the grocery store oh, once yes, in a while well you buy things in the grocery store now surprisingly that's owned by the tobacco industry because they've been kicked out of the United States and they've invaded England and a friend of mine over there wrote me and he says I'm having an audience with the Queen to tell them what you they've done to the tobacco the cigarette industry but he says they've got a toehold over here but she can keep them out of their their factories anyway I'd ask a question when you were a small girl, what chores did you do around the house? Huh? What chores did you do around the house? What work? Anything that was hard work. Laundry? 
Oh, yes. How'd you do it? I do my own laundry, a lot of it now, but one the girl who works for me takes my things home with her and does them right. And I, I, I was not above doing anything that had to be done. You have a garden? Have a garden? At home? When you were small? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, my father would raise the garden, and he'd hire a man to come along and work for him, and he'd take the hoe and go ahead of him and let the man follow him and pay him, I think he paid him 25 cents an hour when he had a gardener. And I have a friend, now this girl who drives for me, lady who drives for me, has a brother who lives in the country, and he has a, a uh, what do you call it? When they have a, excuse me, when they have a, uh, a garden, uh, he raises uh, potatoes, Sweet and Irish, beets, carrots, radishes, onions, and doesn't spray them. So I'm one of his customers. Because I read everything that Ralph Nader writes, and he gets after those people out in California, but he's waging a losing battle because they spray, all the apples are sprayed, and I quit eating apples. And the only one that isn't sprayed is the granny, the green one. It's impervious to invasion of bugs or insects or anything. And um, I got in acquainted with a man who uh, is with the House of Almonds. And they spray their almond trees, but they don't spray the trees. They inject it into the roots. So it gets into the fruit after all. So you can't win for losing. Well, I'm going to shut this off. You mean that thing has been going all this time? Oh, part of the time. <laughs> Well, that's not for publicity Thank you. now. Oh, okay. That's for posterity. Yes. Oh, let me give, here's one of my cards. Oh, yes. And you do this for the... Um, Oklahoma Historical Society. Joe Todd. Now, what relation was your father to the Lincoln family? It's on my mother's side. Oh, yes, the Todd. My mother's also a Todd. Oh, she? Yeah. And where does she live? 